Hi, welcome to our concurrency unit in operating systems. We're trying something different here, which is have you watch lectures at home and then we'll work out homework style problems in the classroom. Let's get started. We'll start each lecture with some learning objectives. These are the things that you should learn from watching this lecture. Our goal today is to first identify uses of concurrency. What is it good for? When do we use it? Identify sources of concurrency. Where do we have things happening at the same time? I want you to understand the scheduler's role in concurrency, meaning how does the process scheduler, which decides what to run next, impact concurrency. I'd like you to be able to identify real-world examples of concurrency, how um, we work with multiple things happening in the real world, and also identify how you solve these problems in the real world. And finally, I'd like you to know the difference between benign uses of concurrency that won't cause any problems in your code from other kinds of concurrency that really need to be taken care of carefully. So let's start off by looking at concurrency in the real world. What is concurrency? It's really whenever you have multiple things happening at the same time that interact. Some examples are shared bathrooms, shared food in an apartment, and traffic lights or shared streets. So let's look at these in more detail. So here's a problem. You have a bathroom and you would like to make sure that only one person goes at the same time. If two people go in at once, nobody likes that. So how do we deal with this in the real world? Well, the answer is we put a lock on the door, which somebody inside can lock when they go in, so nobody in the outside can get into it. The rule is, if you go to the bathroom and the door is locked, you have to wait for it. So the point here is that we have something that's shared, which is the bathroom, and we have rules that express how we share it between people to make sure that bad things don't happen. For our next example, let's look at shared food in an apartment. Suppose you share an apartment with someone and you have a problem that you would like to make sure there's always fresh milk. How do you work this out with your uh, apartment mates? Well, one way to do it is to have a note on the door that says whether we need to buy milk because you used up the milk and there's none left, and then another note to say you're actually buying milk. You need the first note to tell the other person there's no milk available and they need to get it. The second note is needed to let them know that you're buying milk so they won't go and buy milk themselves and leave you with too much milk. So the note here is again, we have a shared resources, which is the milk in the apartment, and we have rules on how to share it, meaning we have rules that say, notify somebody when milk is needed so that we, don't, uh, we will go get more milk and notify somebody when you're buying milk so we don't end up with too much. Our third example is traffic lights and shared streets. Again, we have a problem that we have a shared resource, which is the intersection that cars in both directions want to go through. How do we make sure that cars don't collide? So again, we have rules and we have some state that help us figure this out. So we have a traffic light that tells us which direction cars are allowed to go. And the rule is don't enter the light, don't enter the intersection if the light is red or yellow. And when the light changes to green in your direction, wait for all the cars in the intersection to exit. If you follow these rules, then it's safe for both directions to the intersection and there won't be any collisions. So what have we learned from this? Well, first of all, there are some properties of concurrent systems. The first thing is that there's multiple actors involved who can do things. In this case, it was the multiple people wanting to use the bathroom or the multiple people living in the apartment or the multiple cars that wanted to go into the intersection. Second, we have shared resources, the bathrooms, the food, and the street. Third, we need to have some rules that say, how do we share these resources safely? One person at a time uses the bathroom, um, one person buys food, or only one direction uses the traffic light at a time. So how does this apply to computer systems? Well, we have multiple actors inside an operating system. These are processes. Multiple processes can run at the same time. Or we might have multiple threads within a single process that are running at the same time. So why might you have concurrency? Well, we've seen many of these before. Suppose you have one process that is producing data and another process that's consuming it. Here we want to have the producer and the consumer running at the same time, but they both have to access the shared data for communication. A second reason is asynchronous I.O. For example, you might want to have a web server that can read data off disk and send it to the network. The network, the disk, and the web server are all actors. The shared resource we're worried about is the data moving between the network and the disk. Finally, we might have parallel programs where one thread will split the problem into three smaller problems worked on by different threads. Here, the shared data is the data for the program. The actors are the different threads. The reason to do this is that it makes the program run faster when you have multiple processes. Similarly, for asynchronous I.O., this can make things faster because we can access the disk and the net at the same time on different threads. 
produce a consumer stimuli, we can make go faster because we can produce, be producing things while we're consuming them. So the properties we have for concurrent computer systems are very similar to the concurrent systems we had in the real world. We have multiple actors, in this case multiple threads. We have shared resources, which can be memory, uh, heap variables or global variables, or devices such as the network or the disk. So one thing to worry about is, well, doesn't the scheduler handle this for this? Because the scheduler is responsible for scheduling threads and processes. Um, it is possible the scheduler will help you out and make things run in the right order. However, there's no guarantee this happened. In fact, the only guarantee the scheduler really makes is there will be no starvation, that every thread or process will eventually run. Schedulers generally make no guarantee of fairness, meaning that process A and process B will run the same amount of time, or timeliness, that process A and B will get to run in some finite bounded amount of time, such as one second. One way to think about this is that when reasoning about concurrency, we really try to think about the scheduler as an adversary. It will intentionally switch between processes at the worst possible time to cause the worst thing to happen. For example, suppose we have the code here shown here. Process A tries to count up to 10 and will print A1 when it gets to 10. Process B will try to count to negative 10 and will print B1 if it gets to negative 10. What could happen here? Well, it's possible if you have a unit processor that process A, if it starts first, will run and win right away, or process B, if it starts, would run and, run and win right away. If A and B are running at the same time, then it's possible that they'll sit there forever, and neither of them will ever win, will ever win because they will take turns incrementing and decrementing odd. What this means is we really can't count on the scheduler to help us out in these problems. So one thing to know is when do we not have to worry about concurrency? When do we have to not have to worry about multiple threads running at the same time? The first case is when there's no shared data or communication. Suppose we have three threads operating on three different data structures, perhaps three different arrays. In this case, they're all working on separate data. There's no sharing and no communication, so there's no, nothing to worry about the concurrency. The second time we don't have to worry about it is when we have read-only data, meaning that it's constant. So even though we have shared data, in this example a hash table, the threads are only reading it, so there's nothing that can go wrong. There's no chance that one thread will modify the data and some other one will see the wrong value because the data is constant. Some examples of um, data that is not shared are local variables in your thread stack. These are private to the thread and generally not shared. An example of read-only constant data are global constants that you compile into your code. So what about risky concurrency? When do we have to worry about things? Well, if we have multiple threads accessing a shared variable without any kind of rules to access it, we have a problem. This is like having a shared bathroom with no lock on the door that people can walk in at any time. The second thing we worry about is when at least one thread modifies the resource. So in our hash table example, if one of our threads is inserting into the hash table while the other ones are looking up, it's possible the threads might see the hash table in the middle of an insert and see an uh, invalid pointer or a null pointer and crash. We call this a race condition, um, which is when we have two threads that are accessing the same data without any kind of rules for access. And we'll talk about this in the next lecture. So a standard example of where concurrency matters is in a bank account. Suppose you have a bank server that is managing an account balance. It has one method, a withdraw method that takes an account number or account object and an amount of money to withdraw. And we have two people trying to call it at the same time, shown here in pink and green. Both times the code gets called, it does the same thing. It reads the balance from the account, it subtracts the amount of money withdrawn from the balance, and then updates the account's balance with the new value and returns the current balance. So this seems like it's fine if two people draw at the same time, but let's look at what can go wrong. Suppose we start out with $100. Now remember, these two functions are being called by two different users, meaning logically in a computer system, they'll run on two different threads. The scheduler, as I said, can interleave these two threads in any way we want. So suppose we have the interleaving here where time is starting at the top and going down. So we start off with the balance at $100. The first thread to execute is the pink thread, and it executes up to the point where it calculates the new balance at $90. If we now switch and start running the green thread, it will try to be removing $20, and it'll execute down to the point where it sets the balance to be $80. The pink threads can start running again at this point, and it will save the balance as $90 and return. When the green thread starts up, it will save the value as eight of the balance as $80 and then return. 
The problem here is at the end of this, the account balance is left at $80, even though $30 were removed from the bank account, and it began with a balance of $100. The problem here is that we have a race condition. Both threads are modifying shared state, which is the bank account balance, with no rules about how they should be synchronized. So remembering why this happens, we need to look at what is shared. As I said, concurrency is benign when we have things that are not shared. Local variables are not shared because they refer to the thread stacks. What this means is that you should never store a pointer to a local variable in a global structure, or else that thread stack may become shared. Global variables are, however, shared because they're stored in the data segment that's accessible to all threads through the name of the global variable. Heap variables may or may not be shared. When heap variables are first initialized through the malloc call, only one thread has access to that data. However, if another thread can get a pointer to it, for example, you store a pointer in a global variable, or you store a pointer in another variable that is already shared, then that data becomes shared. This means that heap data variables are only private, are private if only local variables can point to it. So how can we manage concurrency? Well, there's a couple of techniques that computer scientists have developed over the past 50 years for this problem. The first is a set of synchronization mechanisms that allow programmers to write rules on how to manage concurrency, just like the lock on the bathroom door. One of these is atomicity. This is basically make sure that while one thread is modifying data, no other threads can change that data. This is similar to when you're in the bathroom, you make sure nobody else can come in the bathroom. The other major technique is conditional synchronization. These allows code in different threads to run in the correct order. Suppose, for example, you want to make sure that code that withdraws from a bank account waits until there's enough money in the account to withdraw. Conditional synchronization would allow one thread to wait until the bank balance is high enough before the withdrawal runs. This is the end of the first lecture in concurrency. Please take the quiz on concurrency before watching the next lecture.